Welcome to God's Business, where finally Jesus and business intersect. I interview the top Christian thought leaders, influencers, and business owners so that you can build not just a good business, but God's business, where he is the multiplier of your success. Now, we also have a group full of other Christian men that are building companies on Facebook called the King's Brotherhood. 100% free. You have to be a man. You have to be a Christian. You have to be in business, or at least open to being a Christian. Totally jump in if you're not, and and hey, go see why everyone's talking about this. Because when God's the multiplier of your success, you're able to build something that's absolutely supernatural. Talk about supernatural. My guest today has plenty of supernatural stuff to talk about. This guy not only has a really cool, this is something so cool to, to check out called Blessing Boys. And it's actually four of his sons together inside of his landscaping company where they go actually on the marketing side, phenomenal idea. They go clean up people's yards every week for free and it's a way for him to teach his boys. But also his name is Justin Noop on Instagram and all their platforms on YouTube as well. Uh, he has a channel and he drops some of the best Christian content out there, has been going viral. I've been seeing all of his stuff. So I brought him in to really hear his story. And little did I know his relationship started out with a one night stand that led to a child to a relationship where one person was all in on Jesus, the other one wasn't, to now a crazy ministry that they're running together. What a great story of a man on a mission and how God can reconcile and use all things for good, even inside of a situation like this. Tap in this entire thing. Please welcome my friend, Justin Newt. Justin Newt, welcome to the God's Business Show. I'm so grateful to have you here, and it was so cool. I've been following your content for a while now. You guys can actually check them out. I'll already plug it on Instagram. This is the first place that I saw short form content. Little did I know, plug on YouTube as well, uh, that he was dropping long form. We're talking like 27 minutes straight on crazy topics, really cool topics. One of one of them just called me out. It was about Enneagram, and I'm like, I still didn't get to see the the end of the video, and I'm sitting here like wait a second, did he conclude that Enneagram was bad or not? But thank you for being here, dude. And it's been so cool seeing the type of content that you're creating, how it's getting out there in the world, how on both sides from a business standpoint and on a spiritual standpoint, really learning and 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 just, again, just hearing the word of God, right? It's like faith comes by hearing and just hearing your revelations of what scripture talks about and what's to come and how to decipher real world things. It's been very cool to see. Yeah, I appreciate it. Super glad to be here and get to uh, get to talk with you and share some of what we've been experiencing and and what God is doing. It's been amazing. It's been amazing. So I I know what's interesting is you have four kids now, four boys, which is just wild. One of my friends has two girls, and the the question, the most important question, obviously, is do you go for a fifth to try to get a girl? <laughs> I tell you, my wife will tell you if she could guarantee that she would she would do it in in the drop of a hat but whenever we talk to our doctor friends they're like you know the more that you have of one, you know more the more boy babies you have or girl babies you have the better chance you have of having the same sex so it's like it doesn't work that way to where you know and, and my wife's like yeah we've got it we've got a uh, 14 year old gonna be 15 in two months and he's actually driving so he's in driver's ed and stuff like that and the gap we're like Ugh. I don't know. We're just entering just a different stage of life. We've got, you know, kids from age three to to almost 15, such a huge gap. I, th I think we'll just, we'll coast this one out. <laughs> and how old are you and your wife? Because I don't think people would think looking at the video version, if you're watching on YouTube, audio, people probably can't tell, but you know, you look like 31, 28, 34. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, man. I'm 38. So I just turned 38 this month. And uh, my wife is just a bit younger. She's um, 34. So, cool. How did you guys meet? Ooh, that's a that's an interesting topic. So, um, yeah, obviously we're we're believers now. We've gone all the way from the wild days onto the mission field, and now you know serving in full time ministry locally here where we're at. But we met on a one night stand. So I don't know if you've heard any of our testimony. We do in depth video on talking about our testimony. But wow, um, it's interesting back. When we were younger, I went out with a friend uh, here locally and met her at a club. And I was, man, I was, I was not living right, man. I was partying into women, all that stuff. And so we met on a one night stand. 
she uh, ends up going home with me to my apartment. I was in school at the time. And she had been, has she told me she had made a commitment to God, even though she wasn't technically a believer at the time, she had made a commitment to God that she was not going to be with any men for a certain, you know, certain amount of time until she's married or whatever. Well, I'm very persistent. We we're both intoxicated and uh, we have this one night stand. And I think that's it. You know, I'll never see her again, stuff like that. Eight weeks later, I get a phone call and, or a text message actually. And she said, I need to talk to you. And my heart dropped because I knew what, I knew the timing of that. And I'm like, oh boy, what oh is this? God. And she yeah. calls me up and says, you know what? I'm pregnant. And listen, we didn't even know, we didn't, we didn't even know each other's last names. Like wow. this is, this is what happened. So we started developing this relationship after she's already told me this. So I had her come over to the house and um, we started developing a relationship. And, you know, I didn't grow up with any Christian values or anything like that, but I knew, I knew I had to take responsibility for my actions. So I told her, I don't know if I'll marry you. Um, or if we'll be, you know, in a relationship, but I, I'll, I'll do my best to take care of this child with you. And so over time we developed that relationship and, uh, she ended up having our child and I asked her to marry me on the day our, our son was born, our first son was born. And then, and then it shoots into, that's where God kind of crashed in and really changed my life. So this is probably about 15 years. You talked about, you have a 14 year old. Yep. And then you're, which means that when they were born, you've been married, then just, you know, how long until you guys got married after that proposal, which I'm assuming was, man, for people that have kids, if you're actually involved with it, which keyword is involved, this is why people even talk about dad bods. Yeah. And, and technically, like your hormones change when you're about to have a baby, because like the just the way that you work with connecting and bonding with your kid. And the way to combat that is to be completely disconnected from it. Like if you don't even know, like Genghis Khan wasn't like the fattest dude in the world with the worst hormones as he has like 5,000 kids running around, yep. maybe because he was disconnected from it even happening. Mm, but, yeah. but also there's that feeling that when you're going through the labor process and you're involved with it, I remember looking at my wife going, I don't think I've ever been more proud of anyone in my whole life. Like that was intense. Oh, and yeah. it was a lot more intense than I thought it was going to be. Um, I'm sure that you guys were, had gone through that. And then there's the sobering reality of like, maybe two weeks later, you got a baby crying, you've slept a little bit less and you're going, did I just propose to this girl in this height of emotion? How long, how was that process and how long until you guys got married? Um, so we had planned on pushing the wedding out to close to a year. Um, and that it was a crazy process. I was actually in the middle of school. So I was an x-ray technologist for 11 years. I worked at a hospital and so I was at that time, which was 2008 going into 2009, I was right when, when our son was born, I was right in the middle of school. And so, you know, no sleep, school, new relationship, getting married. We're living at my mother-in-law's house. I'm still at that time an alcoholic. And uh, so I'm a daily drinker at that time and going through all of this stuff at once. And so we weren't going to plan to get married until November of 2009. Uh, but the one rule that my mother-in-law made was she said, if you're going to live here, you're going to come to church with us. And I'm like, crap, you know, like, <laughs> like I didn't want anything to do with it, but I'm like, all right, I'll go. So I ended up, I was working like six, seven days a week, including school, just so I could get out of having to do anything that had anything to do with religion. Um, but I ended up, it's crazy testimony. I'll share this real quick, uh, how I met Jesus. But I remember one day I was walking down the hall of her house and all of a sudden I heard this piercing voice. And I don't know if it was audible, internal. All I know is that it struck me straight in the heart. And it said, Justin, the road you're walking down will end in destruction. And I'm like, what? What was that? So I didn't say anything to anybody, but I hear this voice. And so um, for the next two to three weeks, that's all I couldn't get out of my mind. That's all I kept hearing. And finally, after processing that for a few weeks, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I need to go to you know, go to church and, and, and talk to a pastor or something like that. So I had remember the last couple of times that I went, they did like an altar call at the end. So they called people up that wanted to pray with them. So I'm, I'm just waiting the whole time, not paying attention to what he's saying or anything like that. And I'm like, as soon as he says this, I'm, I'm bolting up to the front. Well, he ends his sermon and doesn't say anything. He's just like, all right, we'll see you next week. And I'm like, crap, I know nothing at this point. I'm a blank slate. I didn't grow up in Christianity or in or church or anything like that. So I'm like, what do I do? And so my heart's racing. So I just chase him down and I'm like, listen, this is what's going on. This is what I'm hearing. And he looks at me and he's like, I think, I think this is God leading you, you know, speaking to you. I'm like, all right, well, well, whatever he wants, I'm in. 
And so I gave my life to Christ that day. And that was in March of 2009. And as soon as I did that, the interesting thing was I had never read a Bible. I was 23 years old. I had never even cracked a page of the Bible at that point. All I had to go by was this leading and this calling. And so um, I went back and told my girlfriend at the time, uh, Brooke, and she's like, great. I hope that works for you. You know, um, she grew up in church. She had been baptized 30 times at, at church camp and all this stuff, but nothing ever worked out for her. So I really didn't have a bunch of people around me that were super, super stoked about it, but I knew it was genuine for me because my heart started to change. I immediately started to feel conviction and things like that. And so I went to her maybe, maybe two days after I gave my life to the Lord. And I said, uh, I said, we shouldn't, I, I just feel like we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be sleeping together. We shouldn't be living together. Like we need to separate until we're actually married and we make it right by God. And she's like, I can't take care of this baby on my, on my own. She's like, when is your next Saturday off of work? And I'm like, in two weeks, she's like, we'll just do it then. So we moved the wedding from November of 2009 up to March, the end of March, which was two weeks from when I gave my life to Christ. And so we got married two weeks after I got born again. And I've heard the stats. I actually had a video that <laughs> I don't know why it went viral all to the people that probably shouldn't have seen it or maybe should have seen it. But it basically was just the stat that like it's around 91% chance that if a man gets saved in the home, that the family will get saved. And then, right. and then it's like goes through the hierarchy. It goes through like if it's kids, it's around 8%. And if the woman goes to church, then it's like 17 to 19%. And I had even said the disclaimer that like, even if someone does a diet and says, oh, I'm going to eat this way, the guy's like, I'm not going to eat that. And if the guy does a diet, the women are like, yeah, this sounds great. I've always wanted to be healthy. So like, I gave that disclaimer. Yet for you guys, how did that go in your dynamic? Obviously, the kid's not old enough yet to, to really make a decision. What was her journey like? What, how did she see your transformation? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's like, did she see you change? And it changed her. How did she have her own encounter? Where it wasn't just this information. It's kind of the burden of growing up as a Christian is you get like familiarized with it. The problem that I'll say with that as well is I just caught myself. I was having these revelations reading my Bible and I caught myself not reading it some days for the fear that it became so familiar mm -hmm. that it didn't feel as awesome as when I was having these revelations. And I just felt like I wrote down, I was like, God, I don't want to keep sabotaging my reading. Yeah. And hearing your voice because like I just want to I don't I'm scared that it's gonna become familiar and I'm gonna be like these other Christians that just don't get that exciting feeling anymore. <laughs> For you guys, how was that? You being this new on fire Christian and your now wife being a hey, yeah, I've seen this stuff before. Yeah. When did she have her encounter and how? Yeah, so that was her initial reaction. Exactly that. Familiar. I've seen all this, it didn't work for me. I'm happy that you found this, but basically I just want to keep, you know, living my life. Don't, don't push it on me or anything like that. And so you got to remember at the time she was a, she was a, a professing Christian, but her lifestyle, you know, didn't match up at all. And so mm -hmm. I will say the, the, to, to note what you just said, the, the becoming familiar with the text of the Bible or the, the, you know, monotonous, just going through the routine I've noticed it's when you don't actually obey what you're reading. And so it becomes routine when you're just listening to the Bible, memorizing it, whatever, but there's no action, you know, in your lifestyle. And mm -hmm. so what happened was we actually began to fight even more because there was this schism, you know, there was this divide between, I actually wanted to pursue Jesus. I wanted to read my Bible. I had, I was asking her Bible questions and all this stuff. And she's like, call somebody else. And, you know, she'll tell you this. She was just not interested. You know, she just wanted to, to, she worked as a hairstylist. She just wanted to come home at the end of the day and drink a glass of wine and watch her, you know, drama TV shows and all this stuff. And so it wasn't until around, what was it? Two, so that's from 2009 to 2012, you know, we dealt with this. And we fought and wow. we argued and all this stuff. And, but the thing was, if I wouldn't have gotten saved at that point, we would have been divorced because the way she treated me, um, only by the grace of God and the conviction of the Holy spirit was I like, I'm not going anywhere. Like I'm in this, I'm committed to this relationship, you know, and she'll tell you the same thing. She's like, she wanted me to leave because she felt like, you know, she got pregnant too early. I've stolen away her, her youth and all of this stuff is the things that we would fight about. So in 2012, one night I come home. And she's in the bed doing her little routine, you know, 
and and I said, "Hey, do you want do you want to read the Bible together?" And she's like, "Uh, no, not really." And I said, "You know what?" Uh, I said, I've been reading the Bible and this is where she, <laughs> sometimes you got to poke pride in order to get to the root of stuff. I was like, well, I've been reading the Bible. And I said this in all innocence, I've been reading the Bible, but, but you don't look anything like what I'm reading on this pages. And she looked back and her neck turned red. And she was like, and she said these words, she said, I'm the one who got you saved. Like if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have gone to church. Like this wouldn't have happened. And I was like, whoa, that's a bold statement and no lie. So I'm like, I don't know where to go to the, at, at this point. I'm like, all right, this is I've struck a wrong chord. But earlier that day, a friend had sent me a YouTube video. And this is what kind of sprung this question about. And the YouTube video was called, are you saved or do you just think you are? And I said, well, I said, all right, if you don't want to read the Bible, just watch this video with me. And she's like, all right, I'll watch your video. So, I mean, it was like five minutes long. And this guy gets on and he starts talking about the crucifixion of Christ and what Jesus went through to pay for our sin. And he's like, if you're professing Jesus and you're still living in these things, then you are basically slapping him in the face because you're, you're indulging in the things that he died to set you free of. And I turn around and I look at her and she's sitting in the bed. And now that, that anger has turned the expression on her face was brokenness. And she looks yeah. over me and no lie, this was supernatural. I'm like, I've never led anybody to Christ at this point, none of this stuff. And she looks at me and she goes, Justin, I'm a fake. And I was like, oh, uh, what? Like it worked, <laughs> but now what do I do? And she said that she said, I'm a fake. What do I do? And I'm like, oh no, I didn't think this through this far. So I literally jump on the computer and I'm Googling how to lead someone to Christ. And it's got all these prayers and stuff. So I'm like, I'm like, sweetheart, we can just change that right now. Let's just pray. Just pray with me. And we, I start leading her through prayer and just like maybe 10, 20 seconds into that prayer, she just breaks loose and starts verbally repenting. She's just weeping, crying, repenting of all the stuff that she's done, the stuff she's done to me, the stuff she's done in the, in, in the past. And I just kind of step back and let the Holy Spirit do his work. And now I didn't see, this is in her testimony, but I didn't see what was going on. But she said in that moment when she finished, when she finished repenting, she would, I mean, she was shaking and trembling. She said she visually saw in a vision, Jesus walk in the room in front of her. And he said these words, he said, Brooke, you've played games with me all of your life, right? If you don't turn to me now, I will turn you over to your sin. Basically, he said, I will turn you over to a reprobated mind. You've played games too long. And he said, it's now or never. And she said, when she heard those voices, she said, I've, I've heard the hellfire brim, brimstone messages preached all my life, but there was something different about what Jesus said that day. And that was, there was so much grace. I felt like I could go into his arms. And she said, mm -hmm. her response was, you know, in her mind was, I'll do anything for you. I just, I, I want to give everything to you. And she did that night. And we just laid in the bed and wept. And I'll tell you what, the next day she was a completely different person. It was, wow. it was crazy. She was in her Bible. She, she almost freaked me out because she immediately started to um, believe in the supernatural. And she was reading through the book of Acts and she's like, Hey, there's people getting healed. There's miracles taking place. So she would start praying for the sick and people were getting healed. She was hearing stuff from the Lord and she was speaking it out. And it would have, she's like, yeah, I think the Lord is telling me this, this, and this. And I'm like, listen, you know, now you're hearing from God. I just wanted you to stop drinking and treat me nice. Now she's hearing from yeah. God. And then what would happen is a couple of weeks later, that thing would happen. So she was getting prophetic words. And I'm like, man, this is really, now it's freaking me out. And, you know, and, and ultimately that's what really drove me to um, begin to get into the scriptures and really study about what if, is God, are the gifts of the spirit for today? Is God really doing these miracles today and stuff like that? And sure enough, he opened us, he opened the door in that, that region. Wow. And, and what's so interesting is like you had this pressing forward and then you're sitting there with your wife and then she has this big breakthrough and then it's almost like then she's pulling you forward you're saying wait a second now you're seeing all this stuff happen like i've been doing this for three years now and i've been faithful and now you're having yeah. all these breakthroughs so at this point was that was that different for you i remember when i got saved i told you i got saved out of total demonic like i went to a small group with a youth pastor and two kids and yeah. they were talking about miracles but they were doing this undercover at this church. You were not allowed. Jesus did not do things today. Yeah. And they were meeting, reading stories about what Jesus was doing today. 
And they go, sorry if this is scaring you. And I go, I talk to demons. And they were like, what? I was like, I don't, this isn't scaring me. But it was actually the first time I had heard of anything that wasn't just, a, I thought Christians just didn't drink. They yeah. just didn't really party that much. That's what I thought. I was like, that's not a great superpower. Like, I'm not convinced to become a Christian because you just can't go do things that kids would think was fun. Mm -hmm. And so for you, at this point in your walk, did you not really know that that stuff was possible? And then all of a sudden your wife is like believing it and reading it and seeing it from a different level. And how hard was that to even take maybe like counsel and learn from your wife who is new into this entire thing? And you had been doing it for a while at this point. Yeah, it was extremely difficult. And it, you know, because it was then I became prideful. And what I did is I saw it almost as a competition. And so, do you know what I did <laughs> is I enrolled in Bible college because I was like, all right, she, you know, I'm not going to let her, you yep. know, go too far. And, and so I enrolled in Bible college and I got a degree in theology, a two year degree, and came out extremely religious. You know, I wouldn't say I didn't learn anything there, but basically I learned just how to systematize my relationship with God. And when I wow. came out, I had a whole bunch of knowledge and, but I had no, no practical application. I wasn't seeing what she was seeing. Yeah. I could, I could preach a sermon. We were serving, we were serving in a middle school ministry. So I would preach sermons and stuff like that. And people would say, wow, that's great. You know, it sounded really well. And then she would get up and speak and people would be weeping and, you know, being touched by God and being changed and transformed. And so there was still that division there and it created um, almost like a, a jealousy and a skepticism in me. But the good thing was, is it, it caused me to really begin to seek God in a way that I never did before, because I saw her relationship with God and I wanted that, but I was just so skeptical. I guess it was really my unbelief that was, I didn't like when she was around, it was like she had faith for God to do stuff that I didn't have. So it made me uncomfortable. And so that's what actually led to now we're in about 2016 and we got invited by a friend to go to an event to where there was going to be a uh, prayer and ministry for healing, deliverance, stuff like that. And we got asked to be on the prayer team. And so I'm like, yeah, you know, we'll do that. <clears throat> and so we, we go to this event. This is in August of 2016. And the very first night at the end of the night, the meeting's over. She comes over, Brooke comes over to me and she's like, Hey, um, I met this pastor here and he wants to pray for us. And so I'm like, I don't, okay. You know, I don't, I don't need him to pray for me, whatever. I'm kind of walking over there, but because my wife said, so I go over and we stand there and I still don't know what it's all about. So anyway, this, this, this pastor, he just wants to pray for us to, to receive the Holy spirit, basically to be baptized in the Holy spirit. And so I'm like, okay, I'll receive prayer. And so I let this guy pray for me. And all he does is pray for the Holy spirit to come upon us. And when he does, all of a sudden, I start to feel what feels like electricity, you know, going through my body. Wow. And I'm, I'm extremely logical at this point. You know, I've got my degree, all that stuff. And, and this is not making sense. So my, me being medical minded, I'm like, am I having a heart attack? Like, what, what is going on here? And it just begins to intensify. So my wife's standing next to me and I'm grabbing onto her arm and I'm like, I am not falling to the ground. I had no, I've never been to a charismatic church, Pentecostal church, anything like that. So I start falling to the ground. Next thing you know, I'm face first on the ground. And I am just, I feel like, like a wet blanket had been put over me in a good way, just this supernatural peace. And I remember sitting on the ground for like five or 10 minutes and the thought crossed my mind, this can't get any more intense. And as soon as I said that, it intensified times 10. So I felt like fireworks were going off in my body. Well, I stood up after like 20 or 30 minutes and had no idea really how to process what just happened. But all I knew was I was a different person at that point. So now, you know, little did I know behind the scenes, my wife had been praying for me for months in the closet saying, God, you know, break through his pride and knowledge and all of these things and just encounter him. Like he needs an encounter with you. And this was that encounter that I experienced and it absolutely changed everything for me. Wow. And what a, what a testament too to salvation, baptism, baptism, the Holy Spirit, even look through acts. And it's like, who have you been baptized in? Like what, what name they're Oh yeah, we've been baptized in water. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. Like, got it. We know where you're at in this journey. Now be baptized in the Holy Spirit and how different those two things were for you. And I'm yep. sure your logical side can explain it in such a, you know, better 
way than I can yet. What a, what a difference. I remember the guy who led me to Christ, this, the guy who was the youth pastor, he was the same, he was similar. He's just all that baptism, Holy spirit. That's not for everyone. Doesn't happen. What happened in acts doesn't happen today and all those things. And I was so new that I was like, went behind his back. I was like, I'm going to, I was like, I'm not listening to this. I'm going to go pull one of these guys aside. They're talking about this and what a difference it, it felt like, it felt like I was, I was transformed when I accept Jesus as my Lord and savior and, Mm -hmm. and prayed with them the like what would be considered a salvation prayer. But wow, when I felt that baptism of the Holy spirit, it felt like Jesus was in the room compared to me, like mailing him notes. Yes. That was like the only way I could describe it at the time. And I was 18. So like my ability to describe things probably wasn't that great either, but that was yeah. the only thing that I really remember from that. So what a powerful moment. And at this point, 2016, what were you doing for your main source of income? Like I know that right now you and your family have from social to, to the businesses you run, but at this point in 2016, where was the majority of your time going alongside the ministry stuff? Yeah, so I worked for uh, worked in the medical field. So when I said back in my testimony, I was in the middle of school. I graduated from uh, radiologic technology school, so I was an X ray tech at that time. So I worked at a hospital here locally for eleven years, and I did that. So up until 2016, I was doing that even through um, the first part of 2017. But what I didn't mention to you in our testimony is that amidst that time, like in that time, the Lord had called us to the mission field. And so prior to Mm. that event happening and for me being, you know, baptized in the Holy Spirit, we knew that we had a call to the mission field, uh, but the Lord told us to wait for some reason. And both my wife and I had heard, wait, wait. And we're like, wait for what? And so we were just waiting at this point. And it wasn't until after that experience and that encounter that the Lord said, now you're ready. And I was like, thank the Lord that we didn't fly 10,000 miles across the world to preach the gospel ill-equipped with the power to actually be a witness. We would have just went over there with our, our, our fancy words of wisdom, not recognizing if we want to go to unreached places, we're going to meet things like uh, uh, witch doctors and, and other, other religions that have a very keen sense of the spiritual atmosphere in the demonic realm. Um, that are utilizing things like familiar spirits and stuff like that. And we were not equipped to combat that. And so it wasn't until that point that the Lord began to teach us this whole other side of Christianity that we weren't taught in church. And that is, you know, what you read in Acts chapter 1, 8, the power to be a witness and go out and preach the gospel. Wow. And and I would love to hear what what did you guys go do and what did you guys see? And also, if there's ever a time that you recommend either a book or a place in scripture that people can go read about certain things. You had even mentioned something called familiar spirits. Someone had just recommended a book to me, like overcoming familiar spirits, I think is literally what it's called. Mm -hmm. And and they had just said, Oh, that like, this is a great book. And I have, I just got it in yet. If you have any recommendations on either books or a specific place, like please drop them. But if you guys went out there in the ministry after, like, where did you guys go? And did you guys come up against some of these things that you were just talking about? Like, these other countries, man, they do. Supernatural is even normal. My nanny here from Brazil was like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, like spiritual things are like very common for us. Like my brother's been healed at our church. Uh, we've seen other like on the negative side, like kind of like witch doctors or their version of it do things to harm people or hurt people. And and there it's so normal. The U.S. is probably the least normalized, like more hidden spiritual realm place that you know people have medicines or they don't really go after the supernatural whereas like other countries you know i went on a mission trip with heidi baker in the middle of africa and she like you know she'd go to tribes and be like hey uh if the deaf and bring us the deaf mute and blind and if people don't get healed you can kill us all you know it's like yep Yep. okay like (laughs) this is different than uh you know you got a headache take a tylenol that's it's a little bit different so for you what did you guys see uh, inside of that ministry time. Yeah. So we, at this point, I had only seen really the ministry of healing. I hadn't seen any deliverance or casting out of demons. And so that was still new to me. So in two, that, that was, remember that was in the summer of 2016 when that happened in December of 2016, had an experience where we went over my mother's house 
me and my wife and my youngest son at the time, who was around three years old, and we were having a conversation with her and she started telling us about some spiritual experiences she was having at night. And that was that she would wake up where she felt like something was lying over her body, where she even felt like her yeah. mouth was being covered, something was holding her down. And then she would have to kind of fight it until it would release off of her. And I remember, you know, this is still again, new to us. So she stepped out of the room for a minute to go to the bathroom. And my wife uh, looked at me and I said, I, I really think we need to pray for my mom. And she's like, I agree. I'm trembling inside. And so at that point I'm thinking, you know, never seen a demon manifest or anything like that. That wasn't even on my radar, really, that she would need deliverance or anything. I was just thinking, pray for protection. So she comes back in, of course, agrees to prayer. And I lay my hands on her shoulder. And just like I heard that voice in that hallway that day, as soon as I laid hands on her, I heard spirit of fear just deposited right, right into my spirit. And I'm wow. like, all right, I guess I, I guess I just say this out loud. I'm thinking in my head. So I said, I just rebuke the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. My mom drops wow. to the ground instantly and starts manifesting a demon on the ground. So this is the first time we've ever seen this. And I mean, this is not, she fell to the ground and is just, no, she was literally going back and forth between the cabinets being pulled by something that I couldn't physically wow. see. And wow. so full on manifesting a demon in her kitchen, I look at my wife and I'm like, what do we do? And she's like, I guess you cast it out. And I'm like, how? And she's like, I don't know in Jesus name. And so I'm literally looking on my phone, you know, texting anybody I know that's more spiritual than me. Nobody's responding. So it's just us. So I start just commanding this thing to leave. And I tell, I tell this story all the time. I tell people, I'm like, I started going, come out in the name of Jesus. And guess what? It didn't come out. <laughs> and so what do you do at that point? you know, the person's on the ground manifesting, you just continue to press in until you see breakthrough because the person's right in front of you and they need their help. And so we just trusted Jesus, commanded it to come out, come out, come out. About 30 minutes in, my mom goes from being able to speak to being completely mute. It muted her mouth. And so I was getting really frustrated with whatever this thing was. And I was a spirit of fear, but we continue to pray. And then finally, I'm like, mom, just say the name of Jesus, say the name of Jesus. And her lips release. I commanded the demon to, um, uh, release her mouth and her mouth opened. She said the name of Jesus. She went limp. The demon came out and we just sat there and wept with her on the ground because it was, it just blew our minds. And so that was my introduction into the supernatural ministry of deliverance. Wow, dude. I mean, and to have it happen with your family, like, you know, your mom, you know, it's one yeah. thing if you were to see a random person and you're like, oh, maybe they're a little, just uh, mm -hmm. maybe they do this on the weekends anyway. They jump yep. from side yep. to side, and but to but to see, and then I'm assuming even afterwards the difference that she's experienced, like in her life, being yeah. freed from that, like being able, and being able to see that walk, like continue. Just like mm -hmm. you had talked about your story, you had talked about your wife's story. These are all like tested now over time. And That's you right. talked about baptism, Holy Spirit, and then now you're casting out a demon from a family member. Yeah. What, what was there anything that she experienced afterwards that she, could she tell a difference? Oh yeah. She's, she's never dealt with it. The fear on that level, you know, from this time, now, her testimony is a little different because in the midst of that, she was living in some compromise and I can share this openly. She's okay with it because she's now living, living for Christ fully, but she spent years after that living in compromise. And so she never actually made a full commitment to Christ at that time which was heartbreaking, wow. but it's such a testimony of what, how that's just a piece of the journey. That's not the whole deal. And so we continue mm. to pray for her. And it turns out, um, you know, after some things happened with her and some bad situations, uh, last November, we were um, uh, meeting with her for Thanksgiving dinner and prayed with her and stuff like that. And she ended up kind of confessing some stuff to us and saying, you know what, I'm ready for full surrender. So she, we ended up baptizing her in November. She completely gave her life to the Lord. And I mean, radically, radically changed. We got her plugged into our community and stuff like that. And she's been doing outstanding. So for her, it was a little bit of a journey. It wasn't kind of night and day, but as it goes yep. for getting freedom from that particular spirit. Yeah. She didn't deal with that anymore after that. Wow. And, and you never really know what's going on behind the curtain or the things mm -hmm. that you can't see in life, just like you. You went up to that pastor the day that you got saved and surrendered your life. And that pastor would probably look at it and be like, wow, I mean, I must have preached a great message today or like, yeah. <laughs> but you weren't even listening, right? Like just no. looking back, it's like, there was a lot of things that happened. Even for me, 
Like I had a bad day and I called my friend that seemed different. I showed up to a small group on accident and then I had a desire to read the Bible. And then yep. there was all these things kind of working that led to this moment. And, and that, that makes it tough. Cause like, what do we control and what do we not? Right. Yep. If we're just a yep. Christian in an environment and we're just kind of around, is that enough? Or are there tips that you could give people that are hanging out with family, with friends, with, with maybe high in clientele? And they're like, well, I don't want to be like just trying to drop a Jesus bomb as much as I can to be like, well, I'm not ashamed or I'm not afraid. You know, it's like, I even struggle this myself. I'm like, how, how do I represent Christ in a powerful way where my friends, family, and people come and say, Hey, I, I think it's time for me to fully give my life to Jesus. And and to, to work with both of those sides that God's working on them. But also how do I partner and represent that in a way that opens that door? What would mm -hmm. you say is the I, least I can, if formula I can without calling yeah. it a formula? Yeah, I can, I can only really share from my experience on how I applied what I saw the word of God say. And so people would look at us and say, we're a lot bolder in that respect than the average person is. Um, but what we started doing was just becoming totally open to God, however he wanted to use us uh, in these situations. Our families knew where we stood. And, and for a long time, like even in my brother's situation and my sister, they were kind of done with hearing the deal. And, you know, I didn't have to preach to them or anything like that. They, they know what we do. They've heard us preach the message. We've shared the gospel with them. So now really the only thing was for us to live it out on a consistent enough basis to where they see that that transformation in our life is legitimate. Because the mm. people that know you the most are going to be the hardest critics of your transformation. Do you know what I'm saying? They're going to be like, well, yeah. I know what you've done in the past. I've watched you over the years and we've all got past. So they're, they're weighing that against the person that we're preaching to on the street who has no idea who we used to be. They only know this Christ following person. And so it's, a, it's always a lot harder, I think, with our family members. But what happened is when we got a crash course on the supernatural ministry of Jesus, miracles started to happen. And then there's, they got to do something with that, right? And they're starting to see people, other people be affected. So the fruit started to follow us. And it started by one person at a time. It started one deliverance at a time. It started one person getting healed at a time. And now they're mm. the ones who have to wrestle with that. And so what we did is as these situations began to build and the testimonies began to build, man, I don't have anything else to talk about other than what Jesus is doing in my life because he he has my life. He owns my life. I, I I preach him every day. I You know, I don't push it on people, but if you're going to have a conversation with me, there's going to be a springboard that's all. We would be on an airplane and somebody would be like, well, what do you do for a living? I'm like, all right, here we go. You know, when you cast out demons for a living, like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, it's easy to talk about. And so we always used those opportunities as springboards. And then what we would do instead of shoving Jesus down people's throats is we would share either personal testimony or what we've seen him do as of recent. And that would all of a sudden make people inquisitive. You know what I'm saying? Because like, even if you came up and talked to a person and we're like, hey, I used to talk to demons or whatever. You know, they're going to they're either going to be totally turned off and run away or they're going to be like, tell me, tell me more like what's going on. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so we like to use a lot of those opportunities. And I tell people all the time, um, pursue Jesus, obey him, be open for him to use you in, in every area and then begin to share the testimonies of what God's doing in your life. And eventually, as the Holy Spirit begins to draw different family members and you're praying for them they're the ones that are going to begin asking the questions, become inquisitive, and then you'll have a much better, uh, uh, it'll be easier for them to receive your message if they're the ones that are asking you, if they're opening the conversation. So good, man. And I know that throughout your, your time, when did you actually start getting on social, doing YouTube? I talked about your YouTube channel. I talked about your social media. You have multiple of them, which is awesome. But mm -hmm. when was like, when did you start? Was it a big vision or did you just like, Hey, I'm going to make some content about this because it would be smart. Like, how did you get involved? And it's, and again, you're speaking to a Christian audience. Like you yeah. had talked about, I don't push it on people. If you go yeah. watch his content, you're going to be like, yo dog, you're pushing this on people. No, no, no. Yeah. He's speaking to people that are Christians that are, That's that right. have specific questions that he needs to answer. And if they're not, then, then they're going to look at it differently. Right. You may not be at that point where you're like, 
I believe that the, what the Bible says is truth. Mm-hmm. And if they don't, then something might not make sense. But if they do, yeah. that's the type of content that I see you creating, at least in your personal brand. How did that start? Yeah. And quickly, you know, when I say like, you know, pushing it on people, I, I guess I'm more talking about my own, my, the, my personal connections, one-on-one people. When you're talking to people in person, I see social media a little bit different because when you're going on social media, you're, you're either looking for, you're t- looking for two things, either en- entertainment or education. And so mm. you're going to, when, when you come to my channel, you, you got to expect you're going to get my opinion. And so the way I look at social media is like the, the larger ministry of Jesus to where he preached a message to the multitudes. And then out of those multitudes, many people are going to reject his message, but then he's going to have a few that come in a little bit closer. And so that's my, actually my content strategy. It's another topic, but my short form content goes out far and that's meant to have a broad reach to draw people into the long form content where people want to go a bit deeper into understanding. And so not everyone's going to receive my message, but I found that on social media, if you don't take a solid stance for something then people are really confused at what you're doing or what you stand for. And that's not really what, um, that's really not going to help anybody because you just kind of get lost in the sea. They're like, I don't know what this guy believes in or what he doesn't believe in. So I think when it comes to social media and stuff like that, you've got to be a little bit more bolder and clear on what you're, how you actually want to help people and inform people. And so, like I said, that's going to some, it's going to turn some people, it works as a filter. Jesus did the same thing. You know, he would have a crowd of people and he would say, Hey, eat my flesh and drink my blood or give them like a really difficult teaching, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the people that weren't ready for that message were so offended that they turned and walked away. But the ones that the Holy spirit was drawing, they came in a little bit closer and said, please tell us what you mean. Right. And then he would break it down and clarify for his closest. Wow. But, um, yeah, but but back in 2019, the way it all started for me on social media and, and was by the way, bro, like we're gonna we're definitely like going through that. Like I'm building up to this, like, all right, I want to hear how you got into this. And then I'm like, I just wrote down short term far, long term deeper, uh, meaning with short form content. Yeah. I wrote down the stance, like having a stance where they'll get confused, bold or clear a difference between social, you're getting your opinion. Like they're, yep. they're your channel, your opinion where you might meet someone in person, you might be different, you know, not as like direct and be like, did you know that blah, blah, blah is blah, blah, blah. Like you don't talk to people like that, but just being able to be bold on your channel and then, and then use discernment when you're in a one-on-one conversation, it's different. But if people are coming to your content, it is, I thought that was very good for people to hear. And then that even how Jesus communicated it. And I think that the ability that you're speaking, what Jesus is saying, I think everyone has this opportunity to speak truth and you can always be confident in truth. When you have a that's stance right. that's rooted in truth, it's not really like an opinion necessarily. Mm-hmm. The goal is to speak truth. And so because of that, you're not feeling like, will I believe this in the future or not? Will this come back and haunt me? Though there may be some of that, the goal is like, how can I stay in truth and speak that? Because I can do that with confidence and know that I'm in right standing with God, not just creating strife. So boom, 2019, bring me to it. And then I, I do need these content strategies because I'm going to be using them. Yeah. And this is my way to get them here i'm a nerd when it comes to youtube strategy and stuff like that so Bro, I'll, I'll be Let's glad go. to talk about that <laughs> but yeah 2019 um i also go 112 percent in everything that i do so sometimes that doesn't work out so good because i can get so ultra focused on it but hey those are the people that become successful in different realms because they can they can ultra focus on certain things um which is funny because i'm an introvert as well but I, you know, be, Hey, people are like, they, they would think you'd have to be an extrovert to be on YouTube. But I'm like, no, man, I'm recording videos by myself in a room or with one other person. Exactly. I'm right in my zone, you know? And so in 2019, we actually had taken a break from social media, <clears throat> excuse me. And so we were really processing with the Lord and, and took a break from social media because we were investing in our local community. And so I don't know if you knew this about me, but we started a, a, a house church network uh, where we live in North Carolina back in 2018, uh, before we left long-term for the mission field. And now it's up to about 17 house churches. And so we have a full network of house churches that we help uh, navigate and stuff like that. And so um, in 2019, uh, a guy from another ministry reached out to me and he had seen that we had we had planted about nine churches. And he was like, man, that's kind of an element that we're missing in our ministry. Would you like to come on and do an interview? 
And so I did an interview with this guy, you know, drove down, he lived in North Carolina, did an interview with him. And then that ended up getting, uh, we did like four videos in total. They ended up getting somewhere around 200,000 views. And I was like, oh, wow, this is it's pretty wild. So the first thing that we did, and then later on, we were finding that a lot of our uh, people in our community were asking similar questions. They're like, hey, if you were going to share the gospel with somebody, how would you do that? And I'm like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and just make a video and post it on YouTube. And that way I can send this resource to people and say, this is how we share the gospel. These are the tools we use. So my very first video was just me sitting at a table sharing the gospel. And then I use that as a resource. And I didn't do anything else for like a year after that. And then a year after that, uh, we got a prophetic word from someone that said that like they felt like the time was coming to where we've invested enough off camera to where now we could start preaching our message on camera. And so we prayed into that and felt the go ahead. And that's when I came out and I shared the testimony. Um, if you look back on my very, my second video um, was me sharing the testimony of my deliverance and then how we actually started seeing God work supernaturally in and around us. And so that's kind of how I started on social media was strictly with long form content. But at that point, I didn't really have a plan. I was putting out videos kind of as they came to me and stuff like that. Uh, and then we went from there. It's insane. And and to think mm -hmm. like, I love the prophetic side <laughs> because you can have so much confidence in the prophetic, obviously, as it's tested and tried and like you have good mentors and you have good people around you and and you have confirmation, it doesn't go against the Bible and all these different things. But how confident you can be and what an unfair advantage it is when you're hearing from God in the things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I remember Rick Pino was at one of our events. He's like a worship guy. I can't, yep. I'm just getting the video back now where he had like all of a sudden been like, is it cool if I prophesy? And just gave me this awesome word. And I'm like, I need this back, this recording so bad because I so want to cling on to this as like an inspiration, not yep. just throw on motivation on YouTube, but what is God speaking through people that's encouraging, uplifting and also releases me into that, that next thing I can cling on to it in the day of small beginnings and be like, yeah. oh my goodness. Right. It says like, uh, today I just had read. I think you, bro, you'd totally know. Um, but I, I literally just posted it this morning from Galatians 6, 9. Uh, Let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. And like how the prophetic can oftentimes like help not grow weary because there's times where we're like, like I know what the harvest is supposed to look like. And this could be for everyone, right? A pastor, a business leader. You always think you should be bigger. YouTube channel. Right. There's like, I'm sure that you're doing great, but you're like, man, I feel like there's an opportunity that we could have millions and millions of subscribers here. Like, how do I not grow weary in doing good? And I think that yeah. oftentimes going back to those prophetic words are, are one thing to do it. What's first, what's your thoughts on that? I love it because I think when you look in the scripture, like, you know, you read that scripture, Galatians six, nine, right? It's kind of general. You know what I'm saying? It's encouraging because it's scripture and it says, all right, there's a promise that if I don't grow weary, but then you start to get into like, well, what does that look like practically? What if I'm, what if I'm not growing weary, but I'm doing something God doesn't really want me doing like not a bad thing, but you know what I'm saying? Doing a lot of good. Cause yep. a lot of people will continue to do things in the flesh that are like good, but they're never seeing any fruit from it. And so that's where I think, uh, you know, prophecy comes in. And I hate that a lot of the church doesn't even believe this is a gift for today because that's where a prophetic word can come in and of course be tested, you know, and, but it can be more specific to where, you know, we have scriptures that say hope deferred makes the heart sick. So you can kind of lose hope when you don't have that real specific navigation. And if somebody gives you a prophetic word that really testifies with your spirit and the other people around you, and according to the scripture, that can really give you that extra fuel to, to say, all right, now I at least know. I can start developing the steps to get there. Like I know God sees me. And a lot of times all we need to hear is you're on the right track. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, cause we don't want to get far down the road and find out we were on the wrong road. Right. I heard a CS Lewis quote not too long ago talking about progress, you know, uh, progression. And he's like, do you know, on the, on the wrong road, the person who turns around first is, is the most progressive. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. So you can be on a race on the wrong road. And if you're in first place, you're actually further away than you need to be. 
like it's okay but to hear something to where we we are confirmed that we're on the right road gives us the confidence to even kick it into second gear to say all right i've got, i know what i'm doing now and that's really on my journey with social media that happened to me in around december and january when i found out all right i now i have a better idea of what i need to do let's kick it into second gear and that's where i really started to see all my growth yeah and you said you'd like sometimes go 112 percent into things Mm -hmm. I want to benefit from your 112% over all of these years. What's been on the logical side, what is the way that you approach social, whether it's long form YouTube, maybe kind of touch on like what platforms you're on, what you're focused on and mm -hmm. what your kind of like mental construct of where do I grab topics? Like, you know, obvi obviously with like your calling and all that, but just like on the bare bones side of like this, how I do long form this is what I focus on this. I do short form. Like, what are you seeing that's working right now? Especially as me, like I'm going to use, I'm going to use long form as the ability to get short form. Right. Yep. So, but then there's yep. logist logistical things, right? Like keywords and tags and like making sure that we're optimized for search with, with a uh, high amount of search volume with low amount of created content for that search thing. And, and I've mm -hmm. seen how I've done that wrong in the past. What's some of the things that you're seeing working right now and how do you approach your content? Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's definitely going to be a couple of different models of that, like in, you know, in your sense where you're doing more interviews and things like that. Um, or, you know, we talked about, you know, your friend Sean Cannell and, and how he's going to take more of a search based result and stuff like, you know, uh, uh, he's going to take more of that Avenue. And then there's also the Mr. Beast, you know, Avenue to where, uh, he's going to actually use the YouTube algorithm more to depend on um, him just popping up on people's homepage and stuff like that. So there's different strategies you can take in, in, you know, in what approach you have. I found that over time, long form content, which I enjoy doing, wasn't what the algorithm was pushing necessarily Correct. Uh, in yep. the time period. So I have seen this, you can watch different social media platforms uh, in what they're doing with competing to each other. And you can tell what, what's hitting and what they're going to be pushing. And so obviously everybody was trying to compete with TikTok, you know, so then you got Facebook reels and Instagram reels and you've got YouTube shorts and stuff like that. And so I had to make a choice at that point. I'm like, all right, if my goal is to grow, you know, my channel and to grow an influence so I can reach more people, I've got to figure out what the platform wants and then kind of do that to, 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 to reach these people. And so that's when in, I thought in my eyes, I thought, man, posting a short. So I started off posting short form content like two or three times a week. And then I had seen a few people that were like posting three, four or five shorts a day. And I'm like, oh, I'm I'm way behind on this. And so I'm like, all right, I'm going to try to post. And this is just taking you through the process of how you learn to to build systems, because I had no system at that point and it was it wasn't working. So I was as ideas would come to me, I would run in there in the studio, record a video, post it. It would take, you know, a couple hours in a day for me to get all that stuff together. And I found out that I was just working all the time. And I'm like, there's got to be a better way. And so that's when I started really thinking about developing a system to where I could produce a lot of content and then I could distribute it, you know, over the week. And so I set a number in the beginning. I was like, all right, I'm just going to set a number for one month straight. I'm going to post four short videos. Um, a, uh, a day in back in wow. December and January on every platform that I'm on. And that's YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, TikTok, and Instagram. And so in order to do that, I had to back off my long form content. And so I found that I was spreading myself too thin. And so I had to focus on one thing, even though I knew I would come back to long form eventually for this particular season in a couple months, I said, I'm going to go all in on short form. And so for 30 days, I posted four short videos a day and all of my platforms begin to take off. And so how I manage that with a family, I have a lawn care business, we have full-time ministry, you know, all of this stuff that we're taking care of, my wife homeschools, stuff like that. What I did is I set aside two full days to, to develop my content and then record, record and edit my content and I batched it. So I would batch all 28 videos or however many, many it was in those two days. And so I would actually write out all the content and then I would record all of the content at the same time. And then I would edit all the content at the same time. 
And then I would uh, had a little notebook where I kept and listen, I'm not this organized. So I had to learn this process just so I could actually save time and not drive myself crazy. And then I would um, release the content strategically through the week. And the hard work that I put in to, to develop that system ended up paying off huge in the long run. And now I've backed off to doing two videos a day, but just going that hard for a couple months, you have no idea what that can do for, um, for your channel. And when you came up with the topics, because if you're thinking the two, three, I mean, I see guys doing five to seven yep. short form pieces of content a day, or at least five to seven posts a day, yep. five to seven posts a day. Mm -hmm. times let's let's call it 28 days a month if you mm -hmm. like take off a day or something yeah i'm like that's a lot of pieces of content what is the way that you're doing that with quality but also coming up with your topics right like yep. where are you getting your topics from so first thing i'm thinking of is the person that's watching so who am i speaking to um, and that's going to be the very first step to figuring out how I develop my content. Because if I'm making content for everybody, then I'm going to have one video about some random thing and another video about some other random thing. And I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose my focus. And so I'm looking at the purpose of my channel is, uh, generally it's aimed towards Christians, uh, and it's aimed towards people that are beginning to like, they're they're in this place in their life where they're recognizing there's more there's more to christianity there's more than going to church every sunday and sitting in a pew and listening to a message you know clapping your hands and going out and eating chicken uh you know that afternoon and then we do the next thing next sunday and wednesday so they're getting to the point to where they're realizing there's something more to this what am i missing and i don't have language to it or they're starting to hear what's going on in our nation with you know this rise in deliverance ministry and the supernatural ministry of God. And they're like trying to navigate and figure this out because that's where I was. And that's when I began to kind of look for content and look for people that could help me navigate that process. And so that's the, the step one is to kind of developing that avatar person that I'm trying to help. And now that helps me kind of zero in on what kind of content I'm going to make. And that doesn't box me in to only make content for that person, but at least gives me a target. And then what I do for my personal process is so on a Monday, I will actually sit down and I'll begin to, to pray. And a lot of times different topics or ideas will pop in my head. And so I'll spend time in prayer developing ideas. And then what I'll do is just write down this huge batch, batch list of topics in a note. And I have a separate folder with a note of all my topics. Then after that, I'll begin to narrow down what I feel like I can actually pour into that week, what I can develop further. And when I develop that, when I have those choices of those ideas, that's when I'll start to go into scripture, dig a little bit deeper and research on those topics. And then I'll begin to write out the actual content for each one of those videos. And so right now it's just, it's 14 a week. Um, and I've found that I actually find that if I wake up super early, like before my family's up, that I can, it's a lot quieter and clearer, and I can actually develop those ideas and write them out in a, so sometimes I'll write out 14 shorts. And so, like I said, going back, a lot, like your, your strategy may be different if you're doing long form and turning it into, into short form. I'm going to use that strategy too down the road when I get more into interviewing people and kind of more developed. I develop my idea in my long form content. But as for now, right now, because my main focus is on short form, I'm doing actually dedicated short videos. And so that's when I'll begin to write those out. And I have found I can write out a I can, I can script out 14 videos, um, in a couple hours. That's so good. And if and you're, you're really right, focused, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think as you do, it's like a muscle as you do it more and more and more, yep. it's like, how long does it take for you to record videos? Well, not as long as it used to, like you probably hit most of them first try or, you know, I just, you know, if you have to look at something, there's easy ways to edit. Like I'm sure that you've gotten so good at it. And so it's, some of it's a muscle. For I've also seen that I think they said out of the 50 top most viewed channels right now on YouTube, 47 of them are shorts channels. Yep. So like, it's just kind of obvious, like what you're saying and finding the way you do it. Like for me, I love just hi making you guys do all the hard work. <laughs> like all yeah. I do is just yeah. curious and you guys just say all the fun stuff and, and I just clip that and, and we get a bunch here done. Uh, but also it's like, 
you have to have the short because like again even shows shows do not do good it's too many topics like you have to do clips of shows or like smaller pieces that are three yeah. minutes seven minutes 11 minutes about a certain topic because it's very laser focused and you're not talking about a million things like i've even done here and yeah. so knowing i love that you said knowing the platform and then being creative your own way inside of that specific platform like what is the platform delivering who are they showing or what are they showing and how do we kind of ride that wave in a way as well i also think it's tough because like you have chat gpt now and you have all these different keyword searches they're like i love how you touched on hey like i pray about these topics and i think it, i had this weird thought that i was like man like people are going to have ai be their god because they're going to have all these questions about life and they're going to ask it to they're they're going to stop going to god god what 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 would be the best way to serve these? And they're going to be like, well, it's quicker and easier for me just to tap into AI. What's the best post that I should make for blah, blah, blah. And figuring yeah. out, okay, how do I make the hierarchy of God? I want to hear your voice and God, show me how to utilize these tools in a way where I'm not, not having to hear your voice in order yeah. when I'm using them, which I think was like something that convicted me. I was like, bro, like, but I also don't want to be such a religious tard that I'm like, I'm not going to touch chat GPT because I don't want to get 10 v variations of headlines on how mm -hmm. to say this differently. So I think that, that was, that, that was super helpful to me. The last thing that I have for you is actually something funny. Hopefully I'm hoping it's funny. Hoping it's a good question. Uh, yeah. I, I, we had just been talking about like the Enneagram and yeah. in this video, the Enneagram that literally I just took the test in a car. Someone was like asking me the questions. They were in the car filling out the answers for me and I was driving and it popped out an answer, whatever, didn't think anything of it. And it, and in this, it had talked about that literally people were like, uh, basically demonic presence had communicated to this person on to create the Enneagram. They had used this like basically like demonic style writing to be able to figure out the answers, which makes total sense. Demons have been around for a long time. They yeah. know a lot about people on the surface, uh, mm -hmm. very normal, but I never thought about that. So I, I, my question to you is out of your short form content, long form content, what's been one of the things that you've discovered that you're like, like, that's a wow like that. Like one of your videos that you've made or piece of content that was true, but might shock people like the Enneagram. If you go watch the video is like completely crazy and I, I literally texted my friend already and i was like have you heard about this and they're like bro no and i haven't texted them back yet i just saw it so what what's been something that's been surprising for you throughout that content maybe something that's got that shocked your listeners or, or maybe a little bit disruptive uh, in the marketplace of what people see on the day-to-day -day? yeah honestly it's it's not even that is that specific as the enneagram as it is just talking about the demonic in the church and um here, the interesting thing is here in my hometown, we get a ton, a ton of backlash is because we're not, I'm not just not on, so you know, I'm not just on social media. Uh, we're out here doing the work. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, we're, yeah, at one point in the beginning, wow. we were doing six to seven church meetings in, uh, a week. Um, we were, uh, in 2019, we were doing three to four deliverances a day. And so a lot of people don't get to get to see behind the scenes on, I just didn't just didn't come out on social media, you know, because I wanted to get a big following. And I'm just like, hey, this is a good idea. I see deliverance is popular. Let's talk about it. Um, no, we've done um, my wife and I have done personally somewhere upwards to 800 to 1000 uh, deliverance sessions since wow. 2016 uh, in our area and a few elsewhere and stuff like that. So we have people that will fly to us um, from out of state, drive to us from out of state, and then we pray for them. And then equip them and send them back and they start to spread the message around where they are. And it's, so it's spreading like crazy. And so the only reason that we kind of use social media is to get the word out because there's so many people that the reason people reach out to us from all across the United States is because they go to their church for help and nobody is equipped to help them. And so we also part of what we want to do with our long form content is to help equip people so that, you know, demon doesn't become a bad word. It's like a bad word in the church. And so, you know, going back to what has been, you know, video wise, what has kind of stirred the most up, it's honestly when we begin to talk about the topic, not not of just deliverance, but of a Christian having a demon. And that's where people get get all caught up. But we have found that in the beginning in our journey, we actually spent some time in Mozambique as well. 
And that was the first time we began to understand that it was it was possible for a Christian to be demonized, not owned by a demon, not possessed by a demon, but have an indwelling demon in the flesh or in the mind that needed to be cast out. Because we ministered with this woman who was a missionary, loved Jesus. We watched her life. She was a Christian. And then she was receiving prayer one day and she fell to the ground, started um, manifesting a demon, growling, foaming from the mouth and needed deliverance. And so we went to our leaders and we're like, I didn't know a Christian could have a demon like that. And they're like, yeah, we didn't either. And, and, you know, had to process this whole thing. Then coming back home, we realized that the majority of the people we were praying to praying for were people from the church that were getting set free. And you may be able to say, you know, the first five, 10 people you pray for, maybe they weren't a genuine Christian, but after like 100, 200, 300, and you're praying for pastors, worship leaders, elders, people that have been ser- missionaries, people that have been serving in the church for years and serving Jesus faithfully, and you've watched their life. And uh, then you start to go, okay, my experience is not lining up, lining up with what I believe. Let me dig into the scriptures. And once we began to dig in the scriptures, we seen things like second Corinthians, you know, four, uh, uh, chapter four, where, um, Jesus, uh, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church and he says, you know, just as Eve was deceived in the garden, I'm worried that you're going to be easily deceived and receive a false spirit different than the spirit you've already received. And so we start to see these things and we're like, okay, this, this lines up wow. scripturally. And so when we started doing videos on that, teaching on that, letting believers know it's okay, it's okay. If you need freedom, get your freedom and then continue to pursue Jesus. But to tell Christians that they can't need deliverance is to nullify that ministry, to block that ministry from them and basically tell them if they're dealing with any issues that they can't handle with Bible study or regular prayer or anything like that, that they're just stuck that way for the rest of their life. When we started doing videos on that, hello backlash. Like we get, wow. we get threatened. We get called heretics. We get, you get your life threatened, um, all kinds of issues. And just the comments start rolling in. And for some reason, you probably know this, the, the critics voices tend to be 10 times louder than the other 98% that are seeing something positive from it. Yeah, hundred percent. And yeah. what one thing, just so that people know as well, how would someone know if they were struggling in this area, right? So it's like, if they're like, how do I know if I'm just in my head, right? People say like, your greatest enemy is yourself. Mm-hmm. And and obviously, there's also things that people, if you don't know what you're going through, you don't know that freedom feels differently. If that makes sense, like there's people say yeah. this a lot with health. If yeah. you don't know what it feels like to be vibrantly healthy, it's tough to know that if you're stuck in a chronic dis-ease or like mental fog or something, if it's just normal, then you're like, I'm at 100% of my normal, but you don't know yeah. there's more. How could someone recognize if there's an area in their life that they need freedom and recognize the difference between their own mental torture of just beating themselves up and shame or whatever, and an actual demonic presence that's physically or somehow influencing them. Yeah, and so I've got a a video on our channel, Unshakable Kingdom. Uh, You can just search how to spot a demon. If somebody wants to go further into that, we've got resources on our channel. Um, But there's a couple of different ways that you can can discern that. Number one is really just trusting the Holy Spirit. So if you're a believer, just trusting the Holy Spirit for discernment. So there's even a gift Mm -hmm. of discerning spirits we read about in Corinthians. And that would be to be able to distinguish uh, between uh, specific spirits that are in operation and whether something is caused by an unclean spirit or it's just something that is of the flesh, meaning something that you just need to um, uh, maybe create more discipline in that area or do something on that. But I love Derek Prince. You were talking about resources. Derek Prince has a, a book um, that he has on deliverance that is like the book uh, on deliverance. And um, he, if you just search him, Derek Prince Deliverance, his book will come up. And that was the very first book I read. Super informative. He's a Greek scholar and he just kind of goes through it, lays it out really clear. What I tell people is number one, it would be discernment from the Holy Spirit. So praying, seeking God and the Holy Spirit actually revealing to you that your issue is demonic or is spiritual. Number two, when demons are involved, usually they are, um, they're tormenting. Um, they don't just you're not just tempted to do something, you're driven to do something. So if you have something that's like really, really intruding or you're driven to do it, uh, then that could be a symptom of something that's demonic operating in your life. And those are a couple of different ways that you can can really tell. The best thing is to 
I tell people beyond that is to pray. Find somebody that has any type of experience to where they've actually done ministry in this area and have them pray for you. So it's almost like we tell people when they when you come into me, if I come into my house um, and you're wanting prayer or ministry or anything like that, I'm kind of like a doctor in the sense of when you go to your doctor, you're going to present your symptoms to him, but he doesn't know whether your issue is <clears throat> cancer or um, or, you know, you just had some bad food or something like that, you know, because the symptoms yeah. could be a couple of different things. And so when you come into me and you share your symptoms and you tell me something like, well, I've been having having these these thoughts. And I'm like, well, how, how long have you been having these thoughts? Well, for five years, you know, do they happen once a year and then you can overcome them with scripture? No, they're happening every single day. Right. Or mm. I'm having nightmares five times a week. And these are the specific nightmares that I'm having. Then I'm going to say, all right, this, this is probably demonic, something that you're dealing with. And then we'll go into prayer. And then we have just a, a certain structure on how we pray. We want to make sure that people are born again, because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says, when a demon leaves a person, it goes out, it wanders in dry places. And then it says, hey, I'll go back to my house where I came. Yep. And it says it brings, if it goes back to the house and it finds that place swept clean and empty, then it'll bring seven more wicked than itself. And so we always, when we meet with people one-on-one -on -one or in groups, we preach the gospel with them because the biggest thing is that you know Jesus and that you are born again, because that's what's going to protect you against future attack. And so we preach the gospel in that way and, and tell people that that's the, the primary thing, you know, to be able to stay free. But um, yeah, other than that, it's just praying, praying, you know, commanding the spirit to come out, walking people through repentance and things like that, so that whatever that open door is that allowed that thing to come in can actually be addressed, repented from, cut ties with. And then you just expel the demon. So good. And I think even the the book that you just recommended is They Shall Expel Demons. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Okay, cool. You use the word expel and it totally jogged my memory of it. I was like, oh perfect. Yeah. I have it right here on yep. on uh on Google. Yep. And then it's it looks like it's on Amazon and Audible and of course Christianbook.com. And so I thank you, man. Thank you for for giving the resources as well. It's just awesome to meet you. I've been seeing your short form content pop up on my on my social and it's super fun and and it's just cool to see you talk about relevant things as well or things that are just meaning like today. Hey guys, this is popping up. What does this mean? And you kind of hook everyone in with like we don't really know what side you're going to be on with it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of cool as well. It's like, uh, like what does he say? Does he say that this is bad or not? And I, I just, the whole process is really cool and a lot to learn from. So whether you're wanting to be sharpened in that area, or you're like, Hey, I need to make some of this content too. a great yep. person to go and, and look at what's working for him as well. So thank you, man. Uh, I know that you had mentioned you, you and your family have a few different channels. You have four sons, you have three of them that are working inside of your lawn care company, at least right. is, uh, working as like at least a, a model. Cause they're in the banner photo of your YouTube channel. I know one yep. of them at least actually works with you. Uh, yep. Where are the places that people can go connect with more of your stuff on YouTube, social, and then anything else? Yeah. So for ministry wise, so, you know, spiritual content and stuff like that, we, uh, we have, uh, my regular Facebook channel, which is just under my name. It's my personal profile, uh, Justin Noop, K N O O P. We have a YouTube channel and that's unshakable kingdom. So if you search that, it'll pop up. And I'm also on Instagram at justin.noop and TikTok under my name, Justin Noop. So those are the, the things that I have with ministry wise. And like we had mentioned before, uh, I do. I have a lawn care business and we actually go out once a week and we help people in the community. We do lawn care transformations, so overgrown yard transformations. And that is on YouTube and that's called Blessing Boys. So you can find out those cool transformations. And that's just a way, twofold, that's just a way for me to teach uh, my children, number one, how to have a good work ethic. And I want to teach them to be entrepreneurs and business owners themselves. So as I'm doing that, I'm teaching them all the ins and outs on how to run a business, uh, as well as using that business to serve the community. So, and the other thing is that we're actually helping the community. So these are other ways, like you said, you know, how do you create open doors, serve people. When you start serving people without expecting anything in return, all of a sudden, all kinds of doors open up and then you have opportunities to share with them. Cause they'll be like confused. They're like, why do you do this? Why would you do this for free? And you're like, well, let me tell you about why, you know, and that's an open door to be able to share Jesus wow. and really why you do that stuff. 
So cool, man. So if people are, are listening and you head over to YouTube, you can check out his stuff there, like he had said, as well as on social, we're posting clips of the show. So just go straight from my Instagram over to his Instagram. If you are watching or like actually can see us, which is awesome, then go ahead over as well. We are on every single podcast platform. So anything that does audio, iTunes is the best. So if you use one of those like robo phones that doesn't have iTunes, then I don't know what to tell you, but we're on Spotify for you. So there we go. But I appreciate it, man. Thank you for being here. And it's been such a blast. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me.